This is my first ever Laracon US, which is really cool. And it's actually, oh, thanks. And Laracon EU started the year was my first ever in-person Laracon. So it is really cool to finally get to meet everyone and meet people in person. Um, and if you haven't figured it out already, my accent, I'm from Brisbane, same place that Jess yesterday is from. Now the other thing you need to know about Brisbane people is, and really Southeast Queensland in general, is that we generally exist in two states. So you've got you know, the classy professional look that Jess had yesterday, and you've got the, uh, the shoes off and shorts look that you wear for the rest of the year. So that's what I'm gonna do for the talk. Hopefully that doesn't offend anyone. All right, now, those who've seen me talk before know that I like to do interactive demos rather than just talk about slides. I also like to walk around on stage, but I can't do both, so I go for the interactive option. And when I was planning this talk, I figured why, rather than just me demoing stuff, why don't I make it really interactive? Because when you're learning about security, when you're learning about hacking, you really need to get your hands dirty. You really need to actually do the hacking yourself and learn the tricks and look for the things. And so this talk is completely interactive. I've designed it so you can use it on your phone. So you can get out your phone and you can go through the challenges. Um, or you can use your laptop if you want to as well. Um, so if you just go to laracon.evilhacker.dev, it'll load up to this page, at least the thing you see on the left anyway. Obviously, someone's got to try password. Um, and as you can see, we're going to get the password attempts showing up there. So a couple of GDPR notices for you, since I did this in Europe, and GDPR is important there. Um, your nickname will be displayed on screen, so be considerate of others and what's going to appear up there, and don't put anything sensitive or offensive, whatever. Your email address is just going to go into my database. I'm going to look at it and give some prizes out. No one's going to see it, so it's fine. But if you don't trust me, then put a burner, and I really don't care. And the password is what you're going to appear up there. Um, and please be respectful of what you put into the box of what's going to appear on stage. I don't want to have to kill the screen, but I will if something up there is a problem. So just be respectful. Also, don't run any automated scanners, attackers, things, because again, it will ruin the experience. So hopefully everyone can enjoy this, and you can do it all, all the tricks manually using a phone. You don't need automated um, scripts, okay? So just want to get that out of the way. So we're a hacker. We've come to this website. We want to break into it. What do we do? Well, the first thing we want to do to get into an account is we, we try the passwords, which is what you're doing now. And so generally, you'd use you know, a password list like the top 200 most commonly used passwords or a credential stuffing list. So for credential stuffing list is, for those who don't know, is say you br a hacker breaches an account, a site over here, and they get access to the email addresses and the passwords. Um, either the passwords are in plain text, because that's how you store passwords, right? Or maybe they've got weak hashing on them and they get cracked. And so then the hacker can use the list of email addresses and passwords from this site, and then take them over to this site here. And because people are lazy and people are forgetful, they'll reuse their password. So then you have a list of known usernames and passwords that work on this site that you can now log into this site with because passwords get reused. So you'd use a script that would do automated attacks. Obviously, I don't need to do that because I have, what, 800 people here. So you're my crowdsource brute forcing team. Um, as you can see, we're trying to figure out the passwords there. Um, so let's see how we go. But I do notice that some people are hitting the rate limiter, and I'm guessing that's probably the venue Wi-Fi. So the rate limiter on this system is set up to block via IP address, which a lot of people seem to think is a fantastic way to do it. But there is a problem. It is really, really easy to get a new IP address. All you need to do is use a VPN, install Tor, set up a botnet, hack a couple of machines, then you can use multiple IP addresses. And to make it easy for you all, I'm going to enable bot mode, which is pretending to um, rotate your IP addresses. In actual fact, it's just disabling the rate limiter. So now you can all keep trying to get in. Now the thing about um, rate limiters is if you're trying to do a login, obviously, you know, how, what do you rate limit from? So you could use the IP address as, as we just had, but as you saw, you can easily get around it. But you could use maybe the email address or the username and rate limit on that. The problem you could have from that, though, is if someone wants to lock a user out of their account, they could just keep sending the same request to that username, that email address, and it will keep the person logged out. So that's where you need your monitoring. That's where you need alerting. And so you can say if you notice that, if the system notices, I should say, that an account keeps getting rate limited every, you know, every five minutes for an hour or something, something suspicious is going on. And you can investigate it, check the request, see is someone trying to break into this account or is the user just terrible at figuring out their password? And then you can you let the user know that there's suspicious activity on their account. So you need to be creative with your rate limiting rather than just go for the simple approach which can be bypassed. So how are we going? No luck yet? All right, let me give it a go. Oops. Ah! Like, typing well on stage is always hard. 
And by the way, that is my domain. I love it. Um, all right. All right, that didn't work. See if anyone else has a chance of figuring out the password. All right, then. It's an interesting password. Let's go in there. <laughs> it's bound to happen, right? All right, so first challenge has been broken in. So there's the password that we can use. Now, what do we do next? So we're the hacker. Where we enter an account, we have a look around and see what we can do. So we can see up the top, escalate your account to premium. So if we look around, see what we can do. Well, there's not much we can do in here. But at the bottom there, I've got that live talk helper. So that's the email that you would normally get sent to you when you, you, know, when you sign up. I'll just put it in there rather than have to deal with email gateways and all that nonsense for everyone having a go. And so if we look at the email address and we click on that, we can verify our account. But we're still not a premium user. We're still not a premium account. So what do we do? What, what's the next step here? But the only thing we can really interact with on this page is the URL. So when you're trying to, that's interesting. Why is my name that? Curious. Very curious. Someone's figured it out. Good to see. So in the URL up here, you'll see we have premium over here. But if we change it, we're going to get invalid signature because there's a signature on the URL, right? But is the signature actually required? There we go. All right, what's going, that's very strange. It should say my name there. Obviously I stuffed up something when I was adding that into the page. It doesn't matter. All right, um, maybe it's got something, no, it doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is, point is I'm now a premium user. Weird, something always goes wrong when you do a live talk even though you test it like thousands of times. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make with this is, this is actually a real vulnerability that I discovered when I was doing a security audit for a client. And as a side note, I do security audits full time, so if you want to get a security audit for your Laravel application, come find me and we can sort it out. Um, so, back up to the talk. Um, when I was auditing this client's account, I realized, the client's site, I realized that they would, had a signature on their verify user account um, URL, but they weren't verifying it properly, which meant that you could actually remove the signature parameter and then it would let you in. And the reason why that happened was they did less backwards compatibility things. They didn't have signatures originally, and so they, when they added it in, they realized that all the, the links they'd sent out of our email wouldn't work anymore. So they figured they'd check for the signature parameter, and if it wasn't there, then they would still honor it. And they were intended to go back and remove the check. They never did, they left it in there, which meant it was really easy to get in, remove the signature, and then, then you get full access. Um, and so when you're doing that sort of feature and you're adding in a sort of backwards compatibility, always make sure you go back and remove the, the, the bypass so that you can actually properly verify the signatures. Because that's one of the first things I check when I do an audit is for signatures. I see if there are any signed URLs and then I check to see if they're actually being checked. Sometimes they just completely forgotten to actually verify the signature. They generate the URL, but it's not verifying the signature, so it's completely pointless. All right, so now we're in here. Oh, nice work, Ari. So now we're in here, we can go to the next page. My server's getting a little bit of thing, or maybe that's the storm hitting my internet. All right, so in here we have the um, user bio. Seriously must be logged in as someone else. I don't know why, that's weird. Um, okay, so what we can, what our challenge up here is to edit the admin bio. So how do we get to the admin bio? Well, as a hacker, we get to this page, we look around, what can we do? Now, I'm doing a lot of these through the URL just because it is simpler for doing on the phone. But if we look up here, we've got this users, there's a number, and then edit. So that immediately tells you that that's the ID of the model. It's not just like a profile link or something. So we've got that. Can we change the ID? Can we get to something different? There we have. Now we have a different user, Hank Johnson. And so what we can do is we can keep going through the different IDs to eventually get to the admin user. And once we can get to the admin user, then we can edit their bio. So for those who haven't found it yet, it's number 13. We now have the admin user. Really simple. When they set up this page, they forgot to actually authorize who can access the pages. They forgot to put a, a policy in there or middleware in there or something. Point is, they just made the assumption that you're gonna end up on your edit page. You're not gonna change the URL, and so you're not gonna be able to access anyone else's bio. That's another one that I often find is that you, it's, and it's called an insecure direct object reference, also in IDOR, is where 
you can modify the URL and you can get to different resources you're not supposed to access. Because there isn't a direct link to it, often the developers won't think about the authorization as well for if you just manually go to the URL. So the next step is to become an administrator, because at the moment we're just a premium user, we're not an administrator. So what can we do from here? So we've got the bio box, so we'll interact with it and see what we can do. So, you know, excuse me, we can do hello, for example. What else can we do in here? Can we put some JavaScript? Oops. Wait for it to load. No JavaScript, right? What else can we do? What about, is it Markdown maybe? Wait for it to load. It's now bold, so we have Markdown. Now the thing you might not know about Markdown in Laravel is that it uses common mark. And now the common mark, uh, and it's fully spec compliant with common mark, and fully spec compliant with common mark means that inline HTML is allowed. It, there is code in there that actually gets rid of the script tag and echoes them out like that, but if I do this, we now have an alert box. Cross-site scripting through Markdown default Laravel. All right, so now we have our JavaScript running in here, and keep in mind, this is now the admin's bio, which means that the admin user is likely to see this. So we can escalate our own account to an administrator account, because we can now run our JavaScript in the administrator's browser, which means we can run our JavaScript as the administrator, and we have full access to every single thing the administrator can do through their web browser. So, there's, down here we have the live talk helper, which is, again, to make these things easy for you on the phone. That is so much cooler than the train, by the way. <laughs> Alrighty, hopefully it does that at my crescendo with the talk, because that would be perfect. Okay, so, in here we've got our JavaScript. Now we could do fetch, and we could stuff around with fetch, and figure out where we can get the CSRF token, and all of that nonsense. But we're running in Laravel, we have an application, which means that we can tie into the things the application gives us. So, Axios exists here, right? Axios.post, I can do this. Axios also does CSRF for us, cross-site request for reprotection stuff for us, which means we don't have to care about it. I've got the URL. I've got the magic payload in here. I can just throw that in there, go enter, and we'll see what happens. All right, access not defined. So this is a cool little library I found that actually gets you the browser console in on the page. So this loads up on your phone, so makes it easy for debugging this, pro this, this section on your phone. Um, and it's something that access not defined. And the reason for that, oops, go away, hide. Thank you, Windows. The reason for that is that it's loaded as soon as the page loads before the, the script file has been loaded and then executed. So how do we get around that? Well, the easiest way that I've found is we can just do a timeout. Set timeout, funky bracket there, and then where is it? 100, close bracket, enter. Let's see what happens. All right, no errors, should be a good sign. Escalated to admin, apparently I'm sad over there. I'm now an admin, so I've now escalated my account to an admin by running JavaScript in the admin's browser, which is really cool. So, that's that challenge, what is next? Well, we have the final challenge here, which is challenge number five. So, as a hacker, again, we're, we're looking at this page, we're trying to work out what can we do, what hints does it give us? So if you look at the URL, we can see it says markdown slash about, which suggests that it's loading a markdown page, and maybe it's loading a file called about, like about.md or something. So, to give it a test, we could go, hello, can I find hello.md? Which gives us pretty good evidence that it's actually loading the file from the file name in the URL. Which means that we can try and request other things. Now, it's asking us in the example to load the environment file, so you know, let's just see, is it sitting in here? Forbidden. Alrighty, so Nginx has protection in here for files that start with dots, stop you from loading environment files, git directories, all those sorts of things. But we can bypass that, because of course we can. Um, so, one way to do it is we want to bypass the, the, uh, the web server so we can actually encode the dot. 
So if we can look at the, um, the ASCII cheat sheet that I've got up here, we can see down here the dot is a percent to E. Is that big enough for everyone? I can make it bigger. All right, so the dot is percent to E. So if I throw it up in here, oops, percent to, no, it's to E, enter. Ah, so the browser changed that for us. So we can't just simply encode the one thing. So what if we encode the percent sign too? So percent to five is the percent sign. So if we go to the URL, and I go percent to five, which is the percent sign, and then to E finishes the percent to E of the dot, I'm now loading dot M dot MD. We're getting closer. We still have that pesky extension to deal with though. Um, and so for the extension, um, let's just copy this and we'll come back to it. So for example, before we were doing like, not well, close enough, should be text on that. We're saying yes, it's adding the MD, but what if we, we keep playing around and go maybe, you know, the file is like um, test.txt rather than text.md. And we can see there, it's now looking for test.txt. So it's picked up that there's a different extension on that, pa on that URL. So maybe when we're doing this, we can add a dot somehow. Now it's worth remembering that we're not likely to have the environment file sitting next to our markdown files. It's actually gonna be up a level. So if I do this, up a level, oh wait, the browser getting in our way again. It's gone up a level on the URL. Well, we can easily solve that. Grab that, do that. And now we are, I missed a markdown, didn't I? Hello. All righty, so now we're going up a level, but we still, we still have the extension there. But if we replace this one, so we don't have a directory name starting off the dot, we can now go up a level looking for the environment file, which means that if I do that, we now have the environment file for this application, which gives us the, um, exactly, which gives us the app key, gives us some um, AWS keys as well, Seriously, try them, have fun. Um, and anything else, like the password for the database for sitting right here as well. So now we have full access to this site. So yeah, that's basically game over in terms of thing. But you know, and this is the bit where I'm gonna step out of the, the challenge of what you can do and show you one extra thing. Is because we often say, you know, protect your environment key, and protect that encryption key. But the question is why? What can you do with it? If you steal this key, what can you do directly to this website if, say, you don't have access to the database? Like if there's encrypted data in the database but you don't have access to that, what can you do with the key? Well, let's find out. So I'll grab the key. And then we're gonna look over in our, in application cookies over here. And then I'm just gonna pause the live wire because it makes everything bounce. Cool. All right, so this one here, this one in particular, is the session cookie, which contains all of the session data, because I've enabled session cookies in the environment file, and all of the data for the session is in this file. And it's encrypted with, you guessed it, the application key. So, if I grab that and I go over to, oops, my little hacking tool. All right, and by the way, Jess Archer did that, the drop there for me, it's awesome, I love it. All right, so we we'll grab the, um, the key, that in there. Okay, target user ID, well we know the admin is 13. The encryption key is that magical thing over here. Paste that in there. What it's gonna do is decrypt the cookie, grab out the payload, replace the user ID. All right. Grab that, I put this in here. Refresh the page, and then in theory, we are now a super user admin, having taken over the entire site. And that's what you can do when you can get the application key. Alrighty, um, I'm actually done. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, whatever platform you're on, there are my social media links, and if you want a security audit, there's my website. And I forgot to mention before with the prizes, um, the top person who isn't sad um, will get a free license to my hacking course, um, which is on the bottom, Practical Error or Security, and I'll pick another random email address out of the database as well. And I'll keep the server up for another hour in case you want to keep going on the challenges. So 
Yeah, thank you very much. Give it up for Stephen. So, that was terrifying. <laughs> um, I think, I'll speak for myself. I think that I, as long as I just use Laravel, use regular conventions, I don't really have to worry about that stuff. So I'm watching a lot of this happen. Yep. Clearly I'm wrong, so how do I start like, how do I keep this top of mind? Do I need to be taking, you have a security course probably, so how do I keep this top of mind so that I don't just think Laravel is secure, which it is, but I need to be doing some more, so. Oh, um, definitely follow the conventions, because um, they're good, um, and Laravel defaults does have a lot of security things enabled by default, so that is really good. But keep in mind when you're using tools like Markdown, for example, like the, the comma mark thing, it's spec compliant, and so that's why it's like that, but it is insecure. Um, and that comes down to like checking what input you're getting from the user. So if you're validating the, the HTML that you get from the user, the markdown you get from the user, then you can strip it out or you can add the extra parameters in there. Um, and in terms of just keeping aware of what's going on in the security, you know, in, in the Laravel security space, just to promote my own stuff, there's my mailing list, um, securing Laravel, which you know, I send out weekly emails, there's security tips and such. So that's probably a good place to start um, to keep updated with what's going on. But yeah, just, you know, like the documentation does contain really helpful um, like warnings and things for mm -hmm. various security bits that need, need certain settings or whatever, so yeah. Okay, well the thunder was the right vibe because that was terrifying. Well done, everybody, thanks Stephen. Thanks. Thank you.